I think some of you are perhaps familiar with the um, agri-food globalization process that has been happening for uh, quite some time, but has really picked up pace um, in the recent years. In 2007-2008, um, the UN organizations that deal with agriculture and food, um, especially um, IFAD, the International Fund for Agriculture Development, and the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, identified that there was a food crisis in 2007-2008. The price of food escalated, especially cereals, and conjoined with the economic crisis, it, crea it created really serious problems <coughs> for large populations of the poorest in the developing south. And FAO claimed that, you know, this was not surprising, this was something in the coming because there had been serious underinvestment in agriculture and also a serious inattention to smallholder production. It's interesting to note that smallholder productions, um, people farming their own land, less than a hectare of hand, land contributes to almost 75% of the total agriculture that happens around the world. So there was a call for a, you know, reinvesting in agriculture and um, refocusing on agriculture and indeed that happened, but how it happened is very intriguing and uh, you know, sort of almost ironic. Uh, also because of the economic crisis where there was a real uh, sense of finding new ground for uh, financial investments and for business, food became the new ground for new investment and sub-Saharan Africa strangely identified to be a place um, of water scarcity, not doing well in agriculture, really became the playing field for the green economy. And um, the organization La Via Campesina notes that you know, enormous amounts of money were invested in agriculture and enormous amounts of land were handed over to a select group of private corporations around this time. And um, there were some very interesting articles also in the British newspapers, including The Guardian, where it was claimed that actually the problem with Sub-Saharan Africa was not that there wasn't water, there wasn't actually a physical scarcity of water. What was needed was the investment to you know, bring the water up and make it, make the available water, um, you know, ma invest in making uh, the available water <laughs> available for agriculture. So indeed, um, quite contrary to what was being called for as reinvestment in agriculture around this period, you know, there were structural transformations in agrarian production and trade characterized by privatization, corporatization of land, relocation, increasing relocation because that was already happening, high value agriculture production to the southern hemispheres for northern markets but also for upscale emerging consumers um, in, uh, sorry, consumers in emerging economies like India, China, Brazil, etc. And uh, a definite uh, internationalization of global value and supply chains in agriculture and as Michael has noted in his uh, publication that this resulted in a few gaining monopoly control over different links in the food chain and very strategically. So if you type in uh, globalization of agriculture on Google some of the words that turn back to you are things like land grabs, foreignization of space, uh, food insecurity, sovereignty, and it's interesting to understand, um, you know, why 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 the word food sovereignty uh, comes about. Um, Joanne Mencher writes in one of her articles. She's an uh, agroecologist, a researcher based in the United States. She writes about the fact that. Uh, in the 19, late 1990s, Monsanto, uh, there was an interview of an executive in Monsanto who, um, who said that, they said these very same words, when we control land, water, seeds, we will feed the world. And uh, apparently that um, sentence was quite controversial. So this early subscription uh, to uh, Newsweek, to the 
to the subscribers had gone out but then the magazine itself was uh, recalled and there was not a public uh, sort of uh, distribution of that edition or there was a change in that. It's very interesting. So I think the aspect of sovereignty is very much linked to control and, and gaining monopoly control at all levels across the food supply chain. So indeed, uh, the last few years uh, have resulted in an increasing globalization which tend to bring, which are likely to bring more and more people, farmers, uh, into contractual tenure arrangements with uh, international um, market uh, businesses. And uh, this already very skewed statistics of who farms, what percentage of land and has ownership and control over what percentage of agriculture productive land it looks to be even more skewed um, in the coming days. Maybe um, because we're such a small group, um, if you have questions, uh, please don't hesitate to ask me these. I, I would like it to be interactive in as much as it's possible. Uh, so what's really interesting then, coming back to uh, the sort of the critique, the concern about globalization of agriculture, is uh, according to some, these processes are going to be especially punishing for women and why? Uh, it's claimed that women are feed the world. This is, uh, Tom sent me an IDS report on gender and uh, globalization of food where I picked up this sentence that women feed the world. And what does feed the world mean? They literally women contribute about 60% of agrarian labor and uh, however they own less than 5% of the total land and because of structural, social, cultural inequalities uh, they also have, uh, they are also likely more to suffer food and nutrition insecurities at the household level. So when you translate that to an overall food insecurity, it is assumed that women are going to be especially penalized by this process. Um, another thing um, that's pointed out is that um, these processes of change, the underinvestment in agriculture for a very long time, the inattention to smallholder farming had already resulted in large numbers of men, especially in South Asia, leaving ag agriculture completely um, and leaving women to deal with the farms, but of course without legal land titles and you know le ways to navigate other things that make agriculture productive, like access to water, markets, credit, etc. So this process is called feminization of agriculture and, and therefore it appears that when globalization of agriculture happens and these changes unleash on the ground, it's going to be women who are going to be dealing with that at a structural level. And um, what is on offer for these women in the processes of globalization is wage labor opportunities which are identified to be quite coercive, uh, quite inequitable and limiting voice, dignity and overall food sovereignty for the reasons that I've discussed earlier. Mm. And so these are all the sort of claims by that group of people who don't like globalization of agriculture and who see it as a very punishing process. But there are very powerful actors on the other side who disagree, uh, who say that, as I was mentioning, <coughs> it's inevitable and actually it creates enormous opportunities. The World Development Report of the World Bank in 2012 says that you know, globalization provides opportunities for economic integration, technological diffusion, universal access to information, and provides a never before opportunity for those not connected to be connected to new forms of trade and markets. And it's very interesting to note how this sort of drive by very powerful actors then is uh, how that is taken on by people who are working uh, by organizations, actors who are apparently working on behalf of the poor. Um, KIT, which stands, is the Dutch acronym for the Royal Tropical Institute, uh, which is based in 
Amsterdam, Netherlands, which has very, for very long been working on gender rights, uh, put out this document along with a couple of Dutch NGOs, which is very much saying, okay, just because agri-value chains are currently excluding doesn't mean that they cannot be made inclusive. So the point in case is that we don't debate and, uh, you know, um, oppose these processes, but we just find ways to include women and include people into these processes. And uh, I have a small video to show you, which... Can I ask a question? Sure. Agri-value chain has been excluded. What do they mean by excluding women? By excluding, um, because people, uh, it's it's when you look at, first of all, you are growing for somebody else. So you become linked into um, contracts, into agreements that that are very binding, and um, so that's already sort of said to be not very conducive to sovereignty, food sovereignty, the right to grow, the right to make decisions, the right to, you know, decide what you want to grow, how you want to grow, etc. at a very local level. But um, when you say excluding, it's also the terms and conditions. So, like, if, I, if you look at uh, the factories that operate around the world that make clothes, um, etc., shoes, you know, and there is an image that it provides employment to lots of people, to women and men. But then when you look closely at the terms and conditions of these employment, they are really uh, uh, sort of coercive. So that's, that's the issue about um, not being inclusive, that, that indeed you might be offered employment on these, um, in these new opportunities, but the terms and conditions of that would vary very much, but also that uh, when when agriculture is so um, so globalized, and when there are markets for specialty crops, etc., or there are way, ways of production change, then I think um, you know who gets employed, where and how depends very much. Um, for example, by gender on whether or not women are able to function in certain ways, uh, whether they are able to operate within these new factories of, of uh, specialty crop uh, production, and at what levels, and who's employed where, and at what level, what level of control do they have. So I think the term inclusion refers to that point. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's a small documentary and I'll just show a bit of it and, and then I'll leave it uh, with Tom so you can have a look at uh, the rest of the video. And I think it makes a really interesting case to think about this, this sort of polarized discourse and you know what, what is really being claimed on either side of, of globalization of agriculture is good or bad. It's uh, made by my colleagues who are working on a water justice uh, initiative project in Latin America. It'll disappear if you just take the mask away. It'll disappear. Yeah, it's fine. Siempre a la segunda hoja, si es que el tallo es, es grueso. 
Y si no, solamente la tercera hoja, si es que el tallo es... Eh, ahí está el, el invernadero de la señora Ana Farinango, ¿no? que eh, desconozco que como comunidad no, no hemos tenido tanto acercamiento, pero eh, está, está iniciando, ¿no? prácticamente ella está iniciando y, y no sé si tenga el proyecto de seguir eh, creciendo, ¿no? es, eh, es un invernadero de rosas que, eh, en fin, viene a hacer el progreso de la familia, pero así no viene en parte a afectarnos también como comunidad. Eh, dentro de nuestra comunidad ahorita están, creo que ya sentadas seis, hay proyectos de hay proyectos de unas ocho personas más, entonces eso es lo que sí nos está ya preocupando. ¿Usted ve cambios de la, en la comunidad por la agricultura? También han habido un poco de conflictos en sí entre personas de la comunidad, que ha sido un poco de los más de cambios más de radicales que se podría decir que ha habido por el asunto de las florículas. ¿no? Eh, eh, personas que no están de acuerdo. Eh, la, al menos con lo que, es, lo que es la Junta de Agua de Riego ha habido bastante conflicto. Eh, tenemos un poco de escasez de agua, al menos en estos tiempos de verano, en donde ellos necesitan regar día y noche el, lo que es el, las, las plantas. Y acá eh, la, las otras personas de, de sus alrededores tienen un máximo de, de un día en la semana, entonces ellos necesitan los ocho días. Entonces ahí es donde han venido los conflictos, es de decir, que ¿por qué a ellos sí y por qué a nosotros no? Si ellos les dan ocho días de agua, nosotros también. Entonces esa parte ha sido el gran inconveniente del asentamiento de las no, familias. Just stop it here. I think uh, it's it's interesting. I think to uh, to look at this video and think about uh, the fact that on the one hand it seems to present Anna, this woman, an opportunity to be her own employer. Huh? And as she said herself, that she's worked all her life for other people, and finally she has this opportunity. But then if you also um, see the rest of the video, it's very interesting to note the tensions, the conflicts, and the issues around all of this, including the fact that Anna is actually not gaining <laughs> from all of this. For one, uh, her economic gains from the Rose Nursery are extremely unreliable. Uh, she has to pay a patent for um, every bulb that she uses to grow roses, one dollar for the bulb, and then she gets about four or five flowers, which she sells the value when she sells and is about 50 um, cents. So, and then she has to meet the rest of the costs of running the farmhouse, etc. And um, it also, you know, um, there's a lot of risks involved in the process, including getting perfect roses in time to the person who's delivering these. And indeed, the profit of margin exists, but if you could grow roses tremendously at a large scale, and if you were also were in control of uh, the trade and the export, etc. So the, the, the movie is very interesting to see how, how Anna's gains uh, are extremely questionable, but also that how these processes uh, result in certain women like Anna at least being able to gain that opportunity, a lot more not able to uh, move towards uh, that area. But also it's a very interesting to see how the rest of the community sees Anna. Huh? So in, in that case, how the rest of the community uh, does not appreciate a single woman taking on this uh, employment business. And it was interesting that, um, so there is a certain truth when you say that this op offers new opportunities, uh, a never before opportunity. And I was testing this with some of my, uh, the people I work with, the community in the Eastern Himalayas, and I was saying if there was such an opportunity to grow roses, would you? And you know, immediately lots of women said, yes, we would. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think seeing it from that perspective and seeing it from me and outside distance researcher is very different. 
So I, that's the point I want to make that, you know, as, as a researcher, it's really important to pay attention to these perspectives, how these gains might seem very attractive to people who have for very long been sidelined due to unproductive agriculture. But on the other hand, experience in Anna's case shows that it, it results in quite disastrous uh, situations. At the, at the time that she was filmed, she was not getting any water because she had not been paid by the person who was buying her roses because of a whole series of things and nobody was lending her money because they were, people were already in the community agitated with her that she was, you know, this woman who had taken off to flying without wings, etc. So, very interesting uh, on how there is not a black and white situation as it's often projected. So hence, um, you know, the feminist political ecology which marries uh, the more popularly known political ecology framework uh, with feminist perspectives uh, is interesting because I think it allows asking a couple of questions. So what is new? You know, first of all, it's, it looks at the political ecology framework helps to go back a little further than just the now situation. So what, what does this mean that prior to this new process of globalization of agriculture, there were no prior practices of accumulation, dispossession, expropriation? Um, is this the new evil, <laughs> an entirely new evil? Uh, second, what does it mean when you say it's punishing for the women in the South. Who are these women in the South? Is there one homogeneous category of women in the South? And why is it that we only look at a certain level at the own farm uh, initiatives? Uh, what about other people who are involved on other dimensions and at other scales in the value chain? And also, um, it helps question, I think, um, does it mean that reverse trends are inherently inclusive or maybe also to ask a question, so what should one be doing about uh, such an issue if you were to in, indeed engage with this uh, issue of globalization of agriculture. And just to prove the point, um, I want to talk about the fact that the book that I showed, Living Under Contract, uh, in one of the earlier slides was by Little and Watts who had done this very excellent research in Africa to show that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's been a long, long ago colonization of agriculture. So this globalization of agriculture, the term is certainly new, but the processes are not, not at all new. And in fact, when you look at the statistics of this 72, sev around 72 percent of smallholder farmers uh, who are engaged in their own small farms, the percentage of sub-Saharan Africa is below 10 percent, which is really interesting that the bulk of these smallholder farms exist in Asia and not in Africa for various reasons. And then uh, I come from a region where tea is grown <laughs> and, you know, it's very interesting to note how this very long ago uh, you know, globalization of specialty crops has taken place and on very unequal terms for the people engaged in, in the tea gardens. And what I call is this forgotten injustices and it's very interesting the tea case how in, in relation to coffee at least there was a fair trade coffee movement which, uh, you know, to some extent brought to attention these issues. Tea is a rather forgotten um, issue in, in relation to that and the way in which the colonial government uh, around the regions of um, the, the mountainous regions in India, Sri Lanka, the displacement uh, of people including Tamil refugees who were taken um, you know, at, at the first point to uh, work in these uh, sort of cultivations is very interesting and, and Hence, the point I want to make, uh, what a West, uh, Western Africa researcher Amanor says, is that globalization of agriculture, we talk about it as a now phenomena, but it's actually that would be looking at it in an extremely ahistorical, apolitical context. The other thing that I, that the feminist political ecology is really useful for, it it's asked these questions of which women and where and how 
And it's interesting to note that Andrea Cornwell um, says in a recent article that of course we get carried away by these new happenings which are very, um, you know, news catching, etc. And then we tend to identify that women are punished by these, but the punishment of women is a much more complex issue. And, you know, it's not just these events, but it's a whole lot of interconnected, traditional, old, new, evolving inequities that result in women being penalized in certain ways more than men. So it's very interesting to look at these issues in a much more holistic way. And there was a study done by a group of researchers in the United States who looked at uh, the new uh, you know, globalization of agriculture, both in sub-Saharan Africa as well as in Southeast Asia. And they pointed out that this was you know, indeed dramatically shifting the the uh, the agrarian uh, uh, context, but creating new classes of laborers and farmers. But it was not always clear where women stood because of the simple two facts that women are not all the same, and the fact that these changes happen in very diverse socio-political contexts. So what happens in Malawi <laughs> can be very different to what happens in Laos, to what happens in Nepal, to what happens in China. So I think context uh, is, is very interesting. And there is a very intriguing story around this by uh, a researcher called uh, Priti Ramamurthy, who is based at the Washington uh, University of Washington, who writes about um, how she had the title of one of her papers is Why are men doing floral sex work in Andhra Pradesh? Which means, uh, you know, uh, uh, manually fertilizing the, the cotton flowers, which was a task that was traditionally done by women because of supposedly nimble fingers, etc. And what she points out is that in Andhra Pradesh, ever since GMO cotton was introduced, um, there's been some dramatic shifts. Uh, it becomes productive uh, if you are able to intensely grow cotton on you know small or large fields and um, and there is a huge labor cost to uh, to making this work so as a result of this in certain parts of andhra pradesh and what has happened is that uh, the farmers who were previously growing cotton or something else have now leased their lands to others who want to experiment with this process because the labor costs simply don't add up to you know the the benefits if you were to hire labor and as Ramamurthy identifies this is providing new landless groups of people including Dalits who had worked earlier as laborers to lease these lands and to grow cotton on these leased lands which could then be seen as a positive change because you know from being exploited laborers you are now more in control and you are leasing the land but then of course the labor requirements are intense and uh, Preeti writes of these very interesting social arrangements that happen uh, to find this labor within the Dalit families who will, you know, without cost, pay for uh, the labor costs of this. And it involves really strange arrangements of several marriages, uh, bringing in of young, uh, you know, female cousins from different parts of the country to work for free in these uh, farms and very exploitative relations that happen very much at a household level but very complex in other words it's not a black and white scenario it's not an issue of uh, women uh, because if you look at these Dalit women working in these cotton fields vis-a-vis -vis other women uh, you know perhaps who've gone out of uh, agriculture then you know, can, can, I, it, you, you, it's really difficult to say that it's punishing for all women in a certain context. So, um, trying to sum up, what I want to say is that in relation to agriculture especially, gender does matter because relationships of tenure, labor, <coughs> production, consumption are indeed gendered. And they have been historically unequal uh, between women and men, but also between different groups of women and men. And of course, they are being reshaped uh, 
differently uh, by changes in the agrarian economy's policies and practices. But then it's really important to ask, what does gender mean? Is it just women? Is it a proxy term for women? Or is it looking at the intricate social relationships in different socio socio-political contexts? Um, also looking at where these changes are happening, what are the economic, political, social domains in which these changes are happening, looking at intersectionality, really looking at class, ethnicity, religion, etc., other divides when you're looking at these relationships of production. And also uh, looking at, uh, you know, how the material dimensions of disparity uh, in a in relation to access to land, water, etc., relate to political dimensions of e equality. How do you get yourself included? How do you have a voice? How how do you uh, you know uh, make or are unable to make claims? And I think what one of the more interesting things is also looking beyond the farm and looking into other spaces within the agriculture value chain to see what else is happening at what other levels and, and how these processes are also gendered and in what way. So um, basically to say that indeed globalization definitely brings about accumulation and dispossession, but the outcomes are rarely one for all. And it depends very much uh, if you want a more nuanced analysis of these change processes, I think paying attention to the framework and scales of analysis is really important. It's also really important to understand how you know certain justices or injustices get framed and others get lost and forgotten along the way. And um, as a last issue that I want to talk about, I, which I think is a really important bearing and a sort of a lesson from uh, feminist perspectives, which I think it's important to bring into this context is, so what do we do for those of us who are concerned with these processes and, you know, we want to engage with them, we want to write them, uh, we want to restore some of these uh, inequalities. It's really, I think, important asking what do we do and where and how. And I, um, I recall being at a lecture where, um, I think many of you probably know him, Eric Swingedow from University of Manchester was saying that, especially amongst us Northern researchers, there's a great desire to go out there and help those people out there, you know, uh, and what he was saying is uh, actually, maybe, and especially in relation to globalization of agriculture, I think, it's, I think there's a tremendous amount to be studied right in our backyard where these policies and these strategies are framed and agreed upon. You know, why is it that, uh, you know, especially within Europe, we have very, uh, we have rather, I think, inclusive and, and fair policies and strategies for within Europe. And yet we allow these markets that uh, to operate, that bring us asparagus from Peru, roses from everywhere else. And, and I think paying attention to these issues is really our responsibility. And I think far more than, I think, going off to the south to see what's happening with poor farmers, etc. And I'm especially convinced of that when I was discussing with Tom about his recent visit to um, Andhra Pradesh, where he talked about how activists are coming together to uh, look at these issues of food security and sovereignty. So I was asking him, what do they want from the center? And he was saying, actually, they <laughs> don't want a lot from the center. You know, I, I think it's really more of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, and I, I think that was the big, that was the very big sort of uh, thing that feminist researchers were talking about almost a decade ago, yeah? which is, this is Maria Mies. And I think the sad story about the translation of feminist theory into gender and development, uh, gender in development policy and practice is the fact that what feminists were asking were for really looking at these policies and practices, the economies um, of scale in development policy and practice, 
And however, we did not do that because it was such a political process. What we d then did is, how do we, uh, you know, involve women in in projects, and how do we get women to fit in to uh, some of these changes? I, I think the case in point being the Royal Tropical Institute uh, new sort of agenda to make these value chains more inclusive. So rather than questioning why do these processes uh, you know, how is it that it's acceptable and how, how is it that we have very double standards in thinking about agriculture, etc. And so that became translated into a rather apolitical process about how do you, you know, in, in include and involve women and the poor in these value chain processes. So I think um, that's, that's uh, for me, that's um, a very interesting issue that I would definitely like to, to pursue looking into uh, my own backyard in the northern world and, and I think uh, you know writing, critiquing, talking about, bringing to, to discussion these issues uh, and I think also in that context one last word that there, there are some very positive you know uh, back to local sustainable food processes um, I think around the north which are very interesting but then also uh, very interesting to look at how inclusive are these um, coming from the United States. I definitely know that except in some cases like in Detroit where uh, uh, the people themselves of Detroit uh, being already marginal, their own interventions and their, their own experiments in local food um, is indeed uh, by design inclusive. But elsewhere in the United States, these very um, sustainable practices of local agriculture um, have not really uh, reached out to, to people living on the margins. And, and I think those are also some very interesting uh, issues to look at. And I think applying also a feminist political ecology perspective in, into such um, situations and, and such issues would be some of the things that I would be interested in. But I'll leave it for that at the moment. Thanks for your attention. And I apologize again for the change in time.